Welcome to the Free Will Science and Religion Podcast. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here today with George Ortega. And today we're going to discuss how the belief in a God that is omniscient and knows exactly what's going to happen in the future, how this kind of blows the idea of free will. Um, this is an additional thing to the fact that we already have a, we have causality and a causality, which are both incompatible with us being responsible for our supposed choices. But, but, um, religion has this additional thing where God can know exactly what's going to happen in the future, what people will do, and then can therefore prophesy. And so it's the idea of fortune telling and foreknowledge that is an additional problem. And I'm sure that George is familiar with this too, aren't you, George? Absolutely. And, you know, like some people will say, well, no, God's omniscience or all-knowing nature doesn't necessarily mean that um, we can't do what we want. And, <laughs> and, and that, that's flawed logic. Because, like, basically along with omniscience comes the attribute of infall infallibility. If God is infallible, in other words, if God is all-knowing, that means that God has to know everything. He can't be wrong. Right. You know, so, so, so if, if you kind of like connect the infallibility attribute that, that, that has to go along with the uh, omniscience and, and you put them together, then you understand, yeah, if he knew a million years ago what was happening this very moment, um, there's absolutely no way that it can be different from how he knew it was going to be. And if he and the other part, I guess, is if he knew it back then, the only way I think he could have known it would, and I, I think would be that he would have to be responsible for for having created it. I mean, like, what's your take? Well, my take on this is several things. First of all, a common objection that I hear from people is that, well, God knows what our decisions are going to be and what we're going to do, but he doesn't cause us to do it. And there's a problem with that because, first of all, if you believe that God created you, whether directly or indirectly, by creating your ancestors thousands of years ago, either way, God is the prior cause, perhaps even the first cause, according to your belief, of what you're doing today. And so you can't say that God didn't cause you to do what you're doing unless you are ready to admit that God didn't create you. So there's a problem there anyway. However, there's a, there's a second problem with this. Um, first of all, if God d does know everything and knows what you're going to do, well, how does God know what you're going to do? And that there's the problem there because if God knows that you're going to, you're going to choose to do this as opposed to that, well, God also knows the reason why you're going to choose this or that. So there's a problem, and because there is a reason, obviously, if you know all of the prior causes and all the reasons for a decision, well, then you know what the decision is and why it is. So really, the fundamental reason why free will is impossible is causality. And so whether or not somebody knows your decisions, your decisions are not free in the sense people think it is. Yeah, and Chandler, I, I think like a lot of times when people um, consider this notion of, of omniscience, they relate it to us human beings. They, in other words, the example that, um, that they often cite is, well, if we know, if, if a human being knows that, uh, for example, the sun is going to you know, rise in, in, in the east tomorrow and set in the west, does that necessarily have to happen? Okay, and the answer, if it's a human being, is no, you know, because like, because like, you know, we expect, I think, with 99.99999% you know, accuracy that that will happen, but we can't say that it's completely inevitable. But the thing is that our, you know, we don't have, a human being is an omniscient, so we can't, you know, completely know what's going to um, happen in the future. But again, if God is omniscient, it's a different, it, it's a very complete omniscience and so again like um it, it ties in with, with, the, with the concept of god's infallibility you know god is supposed to be infallible he doesn't make mistakes so like if god knew that we were going to do something you know a million years 
after he, he knew it or whatever, and we did something different, then he would be wrong. And that, that's, that's not possible. Now, all right, so you address this, this notion that um, I want to explore, Chandler, more about um, this, this idea that, like, God knows the reasons for why you do things. Because you, you cited causality, um, but uh, the argument that a free will believer could make is that, well, that, um, and it doesn't make sense, of course, but, but they could say that, well, God knew that the cause of, of our decision was our free will. I mean, I, I, I realize it doesn't make sense. But... <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make very much sense because they have yet to explain how, um, how a free will decision is supposed to actually operate. And I think Trick Slattery had an excellent diagram of that. Did you see that infographic? <laughs> oh, yeah. He does great, great graphics. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because nobody is able to really explain how you can make a decision that's not determined by the prior causes and yet that you're responsible for. Because if it's not determined by the prior causes, well, then it's an a-causal decision, a random just thing that – that you, you do something for no reason, and if there's no reason for doing it, then how in the world can you really – how can you be the reason? How can you be the cause? And, exactly. that, and then they do this thing, well, uh, free will operates on the spiritual plane outside of time, space, and causality. And after that, I quit talking to them. <laughs> no, I know. And so, all right, our, our podcast <laughs> yesterday, we, we dealt with that. In other words, like – People are deciding whether we have a free will or not, not based on reason, not based on logic, not based on science, based on what they emotionally need to believe. Um, I, I posted um, a photo on Facebook recently that I got on my news feed. I, I shared it. It's like it had a um, – you might have seen it. It had an image of a woman, um, like a mother, I guess – you know, telling her four-year-old child, listen, if you don't believe what the Bible says, you know, you are going to spend the rest of eternity in hell. Okay. And, and yeah. Like, and, yeah. So yeah, the, this. I, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I saw that picture. That was what I was going to say. Yeah. And so, like, you know, that it was it was citing it as an example of child abuse, which which I think it is. But, but you know, relative to what we're talking about here now is that it just – it maybe explains why people don't get this very, very powerful, simple logic that, that free will is impossible, whether things are caused, whether things are uncaused. You know, any way you look at it, free will is impossible. These people, I think when they were very young, you know, whether they went to Catholic school or whether they had religions – uh, parents who told them that before they were able to think, you know, because like, you know, a four-year-old doesn't have the capacity to to really reason the way an adult or, or an adolescent would. And so like, I have a feeling that, you know, in their un unconscious is this deep-seated fear of hell. And that's what's presenting, preventing people from getting this. Yes, I think you're absolutely right about that. Fear is such a powerful motivation that it really drives the majority of all human behavior, I've noticed, because you, the, it's, you know, people who um, challenged the church's teachings a long time ago, you know, were condemned by her for heresy by the Catholic Church and executed and, and weird stuff like that. So there was that kind of fear, but, but any type of fear like that nowhere compares to the fear of hell. This fear that you're gonna you're gonna suffer forever after you die. I mean, nothing could be as bad as that. And yeah, so, you, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. And I know that fear very well because that's what I had heard all my life. But then, uh, it, uh, it really changed my life when I thought, wait a minute, there's no way I could be responsible for what I believe or don't believe because isn't aren't isn't my belief based off of the evidence as well as my intelligence and logical ability to look at the evidence and figure out what's true or not you know so I stopped be feeling responsible for my beliefs exactly and, and again even with our intelligence our intelligence it's not something we get to choose how intelligent we are I mean you know our intelligence can increase over over our lifespan if we study more and think more whatever but in general even that's not up to us um, one thing that, that's interesting about 
you know, fear, and we should, I guess, get back to the omniscience um, question because it, it is good. I, we we got to try to figure out a, a stronger case against the objections. I mean, I think when, when I usually present it, I usually present omniscience along with omnipotence. But, but all right, re regarding the fear um, question, what's interesting is that the causality works both ways. In other words, like the belief in free will makes people afraid to um makes people vulnerable you know for to the to believe that in a hell in other words like if people believe in free will then they believe that this idea of hell is justified and that you know creates the fear and the opposite is that like when people believe in Ah, oh, <laughs> I, I lost this. I've been thinking too much. Um, basically, like, all right, the the fear of hell uh, uh, prevents people from believing in free will, and the belief in free will prevents people from overcoming their belief in hell. <laughs> I think I got yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it's t it's very very difficult to separate the beliefs because they can't really be separated. Um, because, as you know, um, like the whole system of a religion kind of falls apart as soon as you deny one central teaching. Like, like some people, I believe it was like Pelagius or somebody who denied the original sin doctrine, because I think Augustine came up with that. But then there's the problem is that the original sin thing was such a, a central part of the theology and belief that supposedly it was because Adam and Eve sinned that we got original sin and that's why Jesus had to die. And so you, you can't um, just you can't just take one belief out and have the rest of it stand. It's a house of cards. But back to the hell thing here. Yeah, um, some people they look at the Greek and Hebrew texts, you know, that later became our modern Bible and found out that there's no, at the concept of hell taught isn't really biblical anyway. And so then they think, hey, this is great. There's no hell. Let's go tell everyone that there's no hell. And then you find out these people are mad that there's no, no hell. They want there to be hell. And I've never quite understood that. <laughs> but it's people hold on to beliefs no matter how bad and painful those beliefs are. Can you explain yeah. that? Well, yeah, and, and, and I think I can and to a certain extent. Um, basically, their belief that there should be a hell um, stems from their belief that there should be justice, and their belief that there should be justice stems from their belief in free will. And to, to explain that, um, you know, the, the concept, the term free will isn't in the Bible. You know, you know, the Greeks didn't have mm -hmm. a term for either will or free will. And there's no term, you know, free choice or free will in the Bible at all. There's, there's choice, you know, but, but nothing relative to freedom. The, the term was coined by St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, in about 380 AD. And he coined it in response to what you were to what you were referring to, this this concept of original sin, of evil. He was trying to grapple with why there would be evil in the world. And like his conclusion was, he was starting from the premise, well, God is all good. You know, so if God is all good, now here's the thing. Augustine could have blamed Satan. You know, Augustine could have said, well, God is all good, human beings are, are innocent, and evil is all Satan's fault. But instead of blaming Satan, Augustine chose to blame us, and that's how this whole concept of free will, you know, pretty much um, came to be such a, a, a an integral part in, in in Christianity and now in Judaism and the other religions. Basically, it was Augustine's answer to to the to the question of why evil exists. Yes, and aside from the fact that free will is is a false thing, there are other problems with Augustine's reasoning. Because it doesn't matter even if you blame the evil in the world on humans or you blame it on Satan. If God created those humans or created Satan or whatever, well, then that doesn't make any difference. God's still responsible for being the first cause and for creating the creatures with free will. <laughs> exactly. And a way to describe that is like let's say we create – let's say a human being creates a robot. You know, like this scientist, this genius scientist creates a robot. 
and through some magic powers, because it would have to be magic, and even magic wouldn't work because magic, there has to be a cause for it, but through some kind of means, this this robot endowed, this scientist endowed this robot with free will. Okay, so like the free will, the, the robot escapes of his free will, the lab, goes out into like the city and just wreaks havoc, just destroys a lot of things. All right, so like they, they, they finally catch the robot, and they find out who made them. So then, like, the robot and and the person are standing in front of a, a judge, you know, for you know for the trial for sentencing or whatever. You know, like now the question is who who do we think this judge is going to indict and going to blame for the robot's behavior? The robot that did not create itself, or or the scientist that created it. <laughs> it's so other, obvious. The scientist. Exactly. Exactly. So and so, like when we apply this this um, reasoning to God, you know, I mean, like, and what what's also obvious, Chandler, is that like when when um when we do good, it's a very very common religious teaching that we should thank God because if it weren't for God, we would not have been able to do that good. So that <laughs> by that same reasoning, you know, both because God created us and because God is all powerful. You know, any time we do bad, you know, we could not have been able to do that bad without God making us do that bad. Absolutely. Exactly. They they try to flip flop. I call it free will flip flopping. They they whenever good happens, then they give credit to God for creating them to be able to do good. But whenever bad happens, well, then the humans are blamed. And but why not give God the blame too? And like you got to be consistent. You really have to be consistent. Because because if God gets the credit for the good we do, then God also gets the blame for the bad we do, since He would be responsible for us for having created us. Exactly, and you know it's not the most. It's not. I can understand how people would kind of like resist that kind of judgment of God because it's kind of like it. It feels good to consider that there's like a deity, a God up there who loves us is in all good and all and that's that's you know I can understand the reasoning for it and so like I have come up with with a, a kind of a a reasoning that can even absolve God of, of, of being evil of doing evil and I'm, I'm not sure it's completely satisfactory but it, it does it it, it 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 goes into the realm of what we what is logical and then what transcends logic and what I mean by that is that like um as far as we know, you know, like the um, time regresses back to the Big Bang. That's the first known instance of our universe. But then logic tells us that, well, no, the Big Bang was in the beginning. There must have been something before that, and there must have been something before that, you know. And like this, this regression, you know, back into the eternal past, according to logic, doesn't seem to stop any, at any point. In other words, it seems to go, time seems to go back eternally into the past, never, there never being a beginning. And I think like we can like, we understand that like relative to God, God is supposed to kind of like have no beginning, no end, God being eternal. So, so that's the thing. So if God is eternal and if time is eternal, in order to blame God for any act of evil, we would have to come up with an exact moment in time where God decided, well, I'm going to cause this evil to happen. But if we have an eternal regress of time and an eternal God going back eternally into the past, never, you know, reaching up that point, then by that reasoning, we can absolve God of any evil also because there was never a point at which God decided that there should be evil. Exactly, George. And this is something very interesting since you brought it up is, see, I believe in the infinite regress because it doesn't make sense to think of a first cause because then I'm like, well, what caused the first cause? You know, it's just it does blow your mind either way because to think of a beginning blows your mind. But for some people, an infinite um, regress where things just inf go infinitely backward in time or infinitely forward in time blows people's minds and yet the reason that I found it more palatable if that's the right word I'm not sure um, to believe that there is an eternal past just like there's an eternal future is because you know what I always 
already believed that back as as a Christian. I was like that there was that you know that God had no beginning or end. But now I look at it. If if you believe in a God that has no beginning or end, well then that means that there's no beginning or end because if something always existed, whether that's God or the universe or whatever, then there was no beginning. There is no end. You know. And so I think of like humans and other animals as the consciousness and the memories that they have as having a beginning and an end. But the universe as a whole and reality, no beginning or end. And so, yeah, even God couldn't have a free will to be able to choose free of prior causes if there was a God that was doing stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Chandler, you bring up a great point because, like, you know, not only are we saying that human beings um, don't have a free will, we're also saying that God, at least in the present moment, doesn't have a free will either. Because you're right. Because, <laughs> because you're right. Because, like, the way God is at this exact moment in time was completely dependent upon, upon the way God was at the previous moment in time. And that, you know, state of God was dependent on what God was. In other words, yeah, so God is also subject to causality. God does things for reasons there are causes even for why God does things. And so, 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 um, I mean, the best that we could say is that God perhaps at some distant point in an eternal past, and again, we have to concede that it doesn't make sense, you know, may have had a free will, you know, gazillions of years ago, but because causality is not just a scientific material concept, it's also a logical construct that applies to everything, then God cannot have a free will now because, again, if God knew a million years ago what God would be doing today, even his, his omniscience, to get back to our original point, prevents him from doing what he knew he was going to do. You know, some, you know, prevents him from doing anything different. Yeah, that's a good point because if God knows precisely what is he's going to do or what someone else is going to do in the future, well then, does that mean God has the power to change it? Because if God knows something and then God changes something because he doesn't like the future that he knows will happen, well then that future doesn't happen and so God just invalidated his own knowledge. <laughs> right, so so Chandler, so yeah, so I, I think like there's two ways of, of like – Using this omniscience attribute of God to um, to uh, refute free will. Yeah, the first is to tie it with with the um, the attribute of omnipotence. You know, it's not just that God knows everything. And I think omnipotence, I think, works uh, independent of omniscience. In other words, just the fact that God is all powerful means that like. If God doesn't want you to do something, you're you're not going to do it because he is all-powerful. And if he wants you to do something, you're going to do it because he is all-powerful. So that stands alone. And But I think maybe the, the, the omniscience, the all-knowing attribute, you know, needs to be perhaps paired up with the uh, omni omnipotence attribute and also with the infallibility attribute. You know, if God doesn't make mistakes, you know, then you can't do anything but what God knew that you were going to do or, or not do. Yes, it's very interesting how that works because, and I've heard, you know, the God doesn't make mistakes things, but then humans make mistakes. And so I look at it as a mistake for God to make humans who make mistakes. <laughs> it just gets really funny. <laughs> well, well, Chandler, I mean, yeah, you're, because I mean, like, you know, um, Augustine came up with the, the concept of free will relative to, you know, trying to figure out why there should be evil in the world. Now, we have to understand that evil, I think, is what we term to define that which cre creates um, pain, which causes pain. In other words, if an act that didn't cause any kind of pain at all to anyone at any time, then I don't think there's any way we could, like, designate it as evil. And and, and so, like, so, like, you know, this this whole question ultimately revolves to the question of well why would it why would a god um you know a loving god a good god um create p suffering create even the ability for suffering and that's something i've thought a lot about i can't come up with a satisfactory answer just like you know there's no especially an intelligent god an intelligent god who was created able to like create the the laws of the universe our, our brain which is the most complex you know um 
structure in the universe? Why would a, a god that intelligent, presumably that a good god, create suffering? It, it makes no sense. Yeah, it makes no sense. And you know, there's one other philosophical problem that really blew my mind that makes no sense sense there's the ancient question why is there something rather than nothing why does existence exist why are we here why are we conscious i mean this is scary <laughs> yeah chandler why is there something and yet like when you ask that it's kind of like it's kind of almost impossible to conceive of there not being something you know and <laughs> and, and you're right i mean just just the fact that reality exists is a mind blower <laughs> i hear you <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting thing to think about because, you know, I listen to philosophy podcasts and read interesting topics of philosophy. You know, why is there something rather than nothing? The mind-body problem, is there is there a soul or an afterlife? All these different things, you know, I listen to like Philosophy Walk and, and I'm like, whoa, people have been discussing these deep questions that just hurt your brain when you think too hard about them. <laughs> and I don't know what it is, but I enjoy it. To me, it's like a game. It's like a video game or something to ask these questions and try to figure out, well, what's right, what's true? Yeah, no, I do too. I do too. And for example, with with this this question of, 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 of you know, why is there suffering in the world? Um, I think we can we can tie this together with like why is there existence and also like the 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 fact the logical fact that um, that God or the universe is one you know if God is everything if God is everywhere then God is all there is I mean w everything is a part of God I mean that that tends to be my belief and so like here you have a God being you know existing eternally as one there's nothing else but god and so like you know and in terms of like why suffering exists you know i i hope this is not the case i'm hope i'm i hope i'm wrong in this but sometimes i kind of like think that well that must be that can be a horrible state to be in very very lonely you know god existing eternally just being one and so that i think you know maybe out of that suffering out of that pain that god was cre um experiencing God just creates worlds like this maybe being one of of an infinite number of worlds God has created and and maybe yeah maybe our suffering reflects God's suffering of, of being being uh, in a sense condemned to be one to, to, to have this solitary existence yeah it's it's actually very interesting because I know you're a pantheist where you kind of equate God with the universe and what's interesting is before I met you, I'd never heard of such a thing, you know, because I was always taught, well, God is outside of time and space, outside the universe. And I'm like, what? You know, so because that was what I heard for well over 20 years of my life, you know, I just my I say, I say I'm an atheist because, well, I don't believe there's something outside of the universe because that's outside of existence. <laughs> I have, yeah, I agree with you completely. I hear you. All right, so we got a couple minutes left, right? Yeah, I guess so. I'm not entirely sure about the time because um, it tells me how long it's been since the call started, which is 32 minutes about. But we weren't recording that entire time. But I guess we better close it up. Let's see. Yeah, no, I, I, I started the timer as soon as you started. So, yeah, we've got um, about a minute and a half left. Okay, should I should I do the uh, exiting or should you or – um, no, go ahead. Just like we can wrap it up however we want. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, in the remaining time we have, um, I hope you've enjoyed this this podcast, and I have, and perhaps, and something we could explore in a future episode is the problem of evil or suffering. Why is there suffering? Because I'm sure this is one of the biggest debated topics ever. And I think it sh we can bring the topic of pain, the problem of pain, and how the avoiding pain causes us to avoid choosing certain things, displaying our lack of free will. That sounds excellent. Yeah, because like I think you know, pain is actually it's it's it it, it describes it explains two things. In other words, like we are we are hardwired to avoid pain, and that makes free will impossible. But that's also a reason why people 
don't want to accept that free will is impossible <laughs> because it's painful for them to, to make that realization. So I think you're right, Chandler. I think pain is something that, that needs to be really explored in depth relative to free will. And it really does. And I can show people that you will actually feel less pain when you're no longer self-blaming for yourself for stuff you couldn't have done differently. <laughs> well, yeah, we definitely have to talk about that. Absolutely. All right. So are we out of time? Yep. Yes, we are. Okay. I guess I'll end, end the recording. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chandler. Excellent show.